Alright guys, welcome back to another video in the Piston series. Today we are doing episode 3, and I know we're back on the runway here, and it's just because I wanted to apologize for the last video. I got so in-depth and so focused about talking about the turbocharger and everything, and trying to get that process, how that works. To explain to you guys, I kind of just glazed over really the main part of that video, the takeoff and the climb phase and how we set our power and all that, and I did a couple things out of order. So I just wanted to apologize, I felt rushed. So we're just gonna do a quick recap. I'm gonna go through a takeoff one more time. I'm gonna show you guys the proper order to accomplish your takeoff flow and your climb flow, essentially, all the way up to cruise. We're gonna fly around and cruise a little bit. I'll show you about setting power up in cruise and our cow flaps and um, just some few other fun facts about the aircraft. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we've already lined up on the runway. I've got all my lights on. I'm gonna go ahead and turn our fuel pumps on. Double check, make sure that you are indeed on the uh, inboard tanks for takeoff. And release the parking brake. And let's get out of here. Nice and slow with the throttle at first. Let those props get up to 2400, 2500 RPM. Then slowly start getting that throttle in there. Try not to over boost. Full throttle is set. <clears throat> because we don't have over. Because we don't have counter-rotating propellers, we're going to have to be dancing on those rudder pedals to keep that center line. Right about 100 knots, we're going to get a nice smooth rotation in. Aircraft comes off the ground, positive rate, gear up. We're pitching for about 120 knots, indicated airspeed here. And if you have a light load, she will climb like a rocket, so, or a piston, that is. 120 knots in the initial climb out. Everything is looking good. As we approach a thousand feet above our field elevation, we are going to do what is known as our climb flow and our thrust reduction. So here comes about a thousand feet above takeoff. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and lower the nose about five degrees. You want to be careful not to descend here, but this is going to translate into about, uh, about 130 knots or so in the climb out. And we're going to go ahead and start our power reduction. So we want to go ahead and get our engine manifold pressure down to our to our climb power setting all right so for setting the power when we increase power with an airplane that has constant speed propellers we want to do it in a specific order for increasing power we're always going to start from the right side of the throttle quadrant we're going to add mixture then we're going to add rpm and then we're going to add our throttle when we decrease power, we're going to do it in the opposite order. We're going to start with the throttle or the manifold pressure, then we're going to reduce the propeller RPM, and then we will set our mixture. So you just kind of have to memorize that pattern for increasing power, start from the right, decreasing power, start from the left. Now, an easy reminder is when you're increasing power, in order to get more power from the engine, you're going to need more fuel. So in order to get more fuel, we're going to have to touch the mixture lever first. When decreasing power, don't necessarily need to bring the mixture out before we reduce the throttle setting because we want to make sure we're leaning for the throttle setting that we're going to use in cruise. So for that reason, it's easier to set our manifold pressure first, then we can set our RPM, and then we can go ahead and set the fuel flow or the mixture for that power setting that we have selected for that phase of flight. So just remember, Increasing power, start from the right, go mixtures, props, throttles. Decreasing power, start from the left. Throttles, mixtures, props. 38 inches of manifold, 2400 RPM, start walking those props back. And then we're gonna be looking for about 30, I believe it was about 30 gallons on the fuel flow. In this Navajo, it seems to be about 25 will be about accurate. So you can see there, I had my mixtures leaned a little bit too far. I should have uh, reset them after we did our run-up. When we did our run-up, we had it properly, but since I redid the flight here, I kind of messed up. So we want to be looking for right about 24, 25 gallons of fuel flow there. Obviously, make sure our EGT is within limits. And now we're cruising out 38, 24, 25, 130 knots on the climb there. Let me lower the nose just a tad more. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to switch tanks. 
So when we switch tanks, we want to make sure that we keep our fuel pumps on and we do it one tank at a time. That way if the outboard tank is empty or if there's some kind of fuel flow problem, we don't kill both engines at the same time. So both of our pumps are on. Let's go ahead and move our left tank to the outboard position. Make sure it's all the way over. Sorry, that was actually our right, right tank. And then we're going to go ahead and turn the fuel pump off. Verify our fuel pressure is holding. And then we're going to go ahead and do the same with the left. You can see here that hiccup there. That's normal. Fuel pressure holding. Everything looks good. And pump comes off. So now we've successfully got our climb flow. Manifold pressure is going to fall off a little bit there. Make sure you keep bumping it up to 38 inches. We've got that nice turbocharger. So we want to make sure we are maximizing its performance. Maintain that 38 inches of, of um, manifold pressure in the climb. Alright guys, so that's the climb flow at a thousand feet. Now, even though that took a little bit of time, as I was explaining to you in the video, in real life it happens pretty quick and it's a constant flow of action. So to actually do that climb flow, it should only take a couple seconds. We're gonna I'm gonna roll some real footage here of my this is actually me flying a P31 Chieftain. And you're gonna go ahead, I'm just gonna cut to the scenes where I do my takeoff flow, and then we'll show you the initial climb flow at about a thousand feet uh, above the field. Just as a side note, you also notice that I had the mixtures full rich for takeoff on this particular day. And that's just because the uh, elevation and particular atmospheric conditions uh, called for a full rich takeoff. So while yes, you can leave them lean from the run-up box as I showed you in the previous episode for takeoff, you can also do a full rich takeoff if conditions allow. <laughs> Right, and this is going to be our climb configuration here as we climb out. Uh, we're also going to start shutting off our lights after you get that climb flow done. We're going to go ahead and turn off the uh, external light there, or the exit light. We'll go ahead and turn the landing and taxi light off, because they are already off when they're in the wheel well. There is a uh, weight on wheels or squat switch um, that will extinguish those lights once they are retracted. So go ahead and make sure that they are shut off after the gear is retracted. And we're going to go ahead and level off at about 7,000 feet here. Alright, for the level off, you want to make sure that you are using your yoke and your trim accordingly. Don't reduce your power setting just yet. Go ahead and get the nose down, get some forward trim on the stick there, and get the aircraft trimmed out. And then we're going to reduce our power to our cruise power setting. So you want to make sure that you let the aircraft accelerate about 150 knots before you start our reduction. Once we start the reduction, we're going to go ahead and bring uh, the manifold pressure down to 26 inches. Now that was what we used for uh, kind of the, the best between economy and, and speed it was 26 inches of manifold. You guys can fly whatever speed you want to but I'm just showing you what we what was our procedure. It's right about 26 inches. 
And then we're going to go ahead and bring the props back down to 2300 RPM. And now we are level at 7,000 feet. So at this point, let's go ahead and gauge the autopilot. I'm going to engage it just so it makes it a little bit easier for me to, uh, to talk to you guys here. Let's go into heading mode and we are in altitude mode. We're going to talk about the autopilot here in just a minute. But for this next procedure, I want to show you guys what we're doing here. So now that we've got our power set, 2300, about 22, just under 2300. Set it right about there. And 26 inches of manifold pressure. Now we need to lean the mixtures for this power setting. So what we did, there's a couple ways to lean the mixture in the Navajo and the Chieftain. You can do what's called 75 degrees rich of peak EGT, or we can do 1525. Now, when you lean the mixture in this piston engine, as you reduce fuel by leaning the mixture, the EGT is going to increase. It's going to get to a point where you are either A, going to hit the red line in the EGT, or B, you're going to actually start taking out too much fuel and the EGT will begin to fall back down. That's called, that little mound is called peak. So if you were leaning for 75 degrees rich of peak EGT, we'd pull the mixtures back until the EGT began to fall. We would note that highest number, and then we'd add 75 degrees to that and put the throttle back in rich to have it I'm sorry, not the throttle, put the mixture back into the rich position, 75 degrees cooler of that peak. Now, playing around in Carinado's Navajo here, as I lean the mixtures, I am able to actually get to my red EGT line before I get a, a drop. So when that happens, we lean for 1525 EGT. Now, I'm showing you guys on this gauge here because we didn't have the fancy digital one over there, but you can use that one too. I'll show you in a minute. But now what we're going to do is we're just going to increase our mixture till about 1525 EGT right there. And then we're going to go ahead and do the same with the right engine just lean it out just ever so slightly. I know my gauges are shaking on you. 1525. Now you can also use this fancy gauge over here. As you can see from what I did in the gauge, I was off a little bit. I'm doing about 1559. So we can actually make it more accurate by looking at this gauge here and putting the mixture in trying to set it for 1525. So we didn't have this fancy gauge. This is nice though. All right, so now that we're set for 26 inches, 2300 RPM, and 1525, last thing we got to do is get our cow flaps closed. So you can see that our temperatures are nice and cool. And actually, I barely was ready for takeoff there. I just hopped into a plane to do this video for you guys. Make sure your, your oil temps are good. But so now we want to make sure that our cow flaps are closed. So let's go ahead and close the cow flaps. And now you're going to observe a rise in cylinder head temp and that's normal as long as it stays within the green you're good to go at this power setting you should be able to fly with your cow flaps closed and when your cow flaps closed you're going to be in the maximum uh, clean configuration if you will there is no drag hanging off the uh, motors everything's closed up and everything looks good and we're also going to go ahead and turn off the exterior wing lights there and we'll go ahead and put our position into the position mode. We no longer need the recognition lights. Now, I know I did that kind of step by step, but in the real aircraft, it's accomplished as kind of a quick flow. So for example, the way I would recommend doing this flow in a one steady move is as soon as you level off, get your lights off. So we go ding, ding, ding. Then we would come over here, make sure our fuel pumps are switch to the outboard go ahead and turn the pump off switch to the outboard turn the pump off and then we come and we set our throttle 26 23 and 15 25 and close those cow flaps it's kind of a constant flow checklist it's not as slow as i did it there but then as you do it with more as you get more practice with it you'll get really efficient with just leveling off lights come off fuel tanks are set 
and then we set our power at cow flaps. Once we're in cruise, I'm trying to demonstrate what will happen here with our outboard tank selection. So in the Navajo, we are designed to burn from the inboard tanks for takeoff and landing and the outboard tanks for level flight. Now as you begin to burn fuel, you're going to get a right fuel flow enunciator light or left fuel flow enunciator light. It's right here and here. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're running out of gas. It just means that you're running out of gas in that tank. So in the Chieftain, I believe, or the Navajo, I believe, I can't remember, I think it was the Navajo, it actually didn't tell you your fuel quantity in the outboard tanks. It only told you your fuel quantity totals. And you actually didn't have the outboard tank fuel being read up here. So we actually had to watch for this gauge or for this light to come on and when the light came on in the real airplane you had about three to five seconds to get your pump on and switch tanks before the engine would sputter out and eventually if you didn't switch tanks it would choke out and die so you want to make sure that you're watching for these lights to come on here your right fuel flow low and your left low fuel flow to come on as soon as they illuminate that's a sign to you hey get those pumps on switch tanks we're going to go ahead and see here if that will happen as we are burning that right tank down uh, pretty darn close to empty. So we'll keep an eye on these lights here. What's kind of cool is if you want to know if this aircraft is performing properly, if you look at this picture here of me and my last day in the, uh, this was a Chieftain, and you could see my cruise airspeed was almost exactly what we're cruising at right now at 150 knots. So the aircraft is fairly well bottled. I mean, for a Carnado product, this is the gem that stands out to me, and I really enjoy flying this airplane. I get a lot of I get a lot of joy flying this this model of Carnado. So as we're cruising along here, waiting for our fuel flow light to come on, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the autopilot. So the autopilot is actually located here in the on the center console, but Carnado provides us with a nice little pop out pilot panel, which is nice to use. It uh, makes it easier. The Navajo and Chieftain had a bunch of different autopilot systems. I flew a slew of different ones from the STEC 30s, STEC 50s, uh, Piper Automatic, KFC 200s, uh, Piper Automatic X, a ton of different autopilots. Now, I believe, maybe one of you guys can correct me, I didn't do too much research. I think this one is the KFC 200. Uh, flight Director Autopilot, which was my favorite amongst all the autopilot systems. The STEC 30s were little autopilots that were basically wing level holders and they were uh, linked to your turn coordinator over here. And for that reason, we were not allowed to do any coupled approaches with the autopilot. All approaches had to be hand flown. There was no coupling, uh, even with the KFC 200. Now this particular autopilot is capable of doing coupled approaches, but you're in Navajo, I suggest hand flying all your approaches. It's more fun anyway. A couple things to note. The proper procedure that we used to level off or use the autopilot was a little bit different than you may think. So if I turn the autopilot off here, and let's say I want to climb up to 7,500, it's not like your typical Boeing or Airbus autopilot where you can just be climbing out at 1,000 feet per minute, hit the out, altitude hold button and it would lock your altitude in right then and there. The actual aircraft would hunt up and down a little bit so it would actually go past your desired altitude then it would come right back down to your desired altitude and some of them would actually blow right through your altitude without any regards to what you commanded it to do. So for that reason it was our procedure to manually fly the aircraft to its cruise altitude. So let's see if I just turn it on here and do altitude hold let's see how it behaves. So you see how it blows through 7600 then it's going to descend back down now the real aircraft would probably descend all the way back down to 7400 or 7300 then back up to 7500 this one seems to be much better in the fact that it just came right back down to 7500 but it was our technique to manually trim the aircraft for a cruise and then engage the alt altitude hold or b Make sure you're trimmed out for a climb rate or descent rate less than 500 feet per minute. If you were climbing at 500 feet per minute or less than or descending at less than 500 feet per minute and you turned on the autopilot and hit the altitude hold button, it would be much better than 
uh, than just having the altitude hold when you're blasting through at 1500 feet a minute. So it was our technique. I personally always pretty much hand flew the airplane to cruise and then I would get it all nice and trimmed out and then I would get the aircraft to uh, engage the autopilot. Now when we look at the autopilot control surface on the elevator, it's actually a very small part of the airplane. I'm going to try to show you guys here. The autopilot is actually just controlling this little part of the elevator right here. So it's trimming this tab up and down which will then affect the flow of air over the elevator. So it has a pretty small control surface here, so you can imagine why it would start to hunt a little bit left and right. Now, if you look at the wings, I can't remember if it actually moved the entire aileron or if it just moved the, uh, the trim tab on the aileron. I can't remember. But either way, the autopilot, it definitely had some authority, but it was not your typical highly advanced autopilot. So that's why we used it with caution. Now, everything else is pretty standard. Right now I'm in heading mode, so I can fly the aircraft by flying a certain heading. Now, if I want to switch to VOR loc mode here, what we got to do is we got to change over from GPS to CDI. I'm sorry, to VLOC. And we do that by pressing the CDI push button here. We can switch back and forth between GPS nav, or VOR nav. So VLOC is what we're looking for. Let's see if we can tune into uh, Endesino, or Mendocino VOR here. There it is, 112.3, we've got it tuned in. Oh, there's our fuel. Let's go ahead and turn the pump on. Get our tank switched over. And there's our engine. Now, I don't know if you guys saw that, <laughs> but see how quick that was? That, I got distracted there and we weren't paying attention to uh, the fuel tank. So let's see if we can get the other one. We'll get back to this VOR tracking here. But that is pretty realistic uh, in the real aircraft. It would keep you awake, that's for sure. As soon as that light came on, you had to be switching tanks or else you would have one of those burbles and uh, it would be a fun little, uh, fun little ride for a minute. All right, so there we go. There's the left fuel pressure low. Get that pump on, switch that tank to the inboard and our engine starts sputtering back up. And go ahead and turn off the fuel pump. And there we go. <laughs> so you can tell in the Carnado, it's pretty much instant. As soon as this light comes on, your engine starts it dot, that starts to die. Now on the real aircraft, you had a couple seconds to actually switch tanks before it shut off on you like that. But it's not to say it's unrealistic. It just might be a faulty sensor. It may be reading at the very extreme, at the low side of low pressure. So. That's fun to have, but that's the proper way of switching tanks. You want to burn those outboards, and then you burn the inboards. Back to our autopilot here. I was talking about VLOC navigation. So now we have our CDI representative of a VOR ground-based nav station. Now, the real autopilot had a tendency to hunt on the, on the core. So if we hit nav mode here, we can see that the aircraft is going to turn and it's going to track the CDI, independent of what I do with the heading bug because we are in nav mode and that's indicated here by this nav annunciator light. Now this Carnado autopilot seems to be very nice, it seems to work very well, so it holds pretty level in nav mode. But just as a fun fact for you guys, when we were actually flying them, it was very common for us to actually fly the flight in heading mode and just manually adjust our heading to stay on course because if you have wind or whatever the autopilot would struggle to maintain the center CDI and you'd end up doing S turns across your course all the way to your destination so it was pretty common to keep us in heading mode but with the Carinata you can go ahead and keep it in nav mode it seems to work pretty flawlessly we talked a little bit about the autopilot the last thing about the autopilot we should talk about is how to descend or climb with the autopilot now most of our climbs and descents were done manually. We turn the autopilot off. But if you want to do a descent, go ahead and turn off the altitude hold mode. And there is no altitude selector window in the Navajo. So what we do here is we go ahead and give it about two taps on the down push button. And that should set your pitch for about 500 feet per minute. You can do a couple more. And essentially what you're doing when you're pressing that down push button is you're commanding a nose down trim on the elevator and you're going to go ahead and get some 
descent. Now you can also do that with climb. You can zero it out. And then we can induce the climb by pressing it a couple times. You didn't want to use the autopilot to climb in excess of about a thousand feet per minute because that you would really start moving those autopilot servos on that trim tab. As you can see here, about 500 feet per minute, there's 7,500. Engage altitude hold mode. The aircraft comes back down a little bit, right about 7,500 feet. Perfect. So that's a little bit about the autopilot and how, how it operates in the uh, Navajo. Last thing we'll talk about is the heater and oxygen. So if you guys are flying in extremely cold temperatures, we got to turn on our heater. Now in the Carinado one here, unfortunately when you press the starter for the heater, it actually turns your defrost on, which is accurate, but we'd have to manually turn the defrost on first. Then we would go ahead and have our starter to on, and then we would put this into heat mode, and then we could engage the levers here to get maximum heating into the cockpit. Now, this heater is very efficient and it will warm the cockpit very fast. It was our procedure to actually, once we shut it off, if we no longer wanted heater, we had to move this into fan mode and let it run for about two minutes before shutting off the unit because we want to get all those fumes out there and want to make sure the, the unit is nice and cool before just shutting it off after it was uh, blasting heat at us. Now the other vents here are just cabin air, cockpit air, and the uh, cabin exhaust air valve here. So that's just a little bit about the heater. The, everything does work. I don't know if you virtually want to keep yourself warm or not. Now I remember the heater actually burned a couple pounds per gallon, um, but I can't remember what it was. I want to say, I don't know, two or three pounds per, oh, I'm sorry, two or three uh, pounds an hour or something like that for running the heater. Pretty minimalistic, but there you have it. There's your heater controls. Last thing you need to be wary of in this Navajo is your oxygen. So by default, your oxygen valve is off. But if you're climbing in altitudes of excess of 10,000 feet, I would recommend that you go ahead and pull your oxygen valve to on. You can see our PSI here now comes up to 1,000 PSI, and we're receiving oxygen. Your pilot will black out if you climb up to excessive altitudes and you do not have your oxygen on. So do not forget to engage your oxygen valve over here. I said in a previous video we weren't this lucky to have this uh, Navajo oxygen panel. We actually used uh, portable oxygen tanks that we would bring into the aircraft. All right, everything else looks good. We've got our fuel pressures going. Our cylinder head temps are perfect. Everything looks good. We are established in a cruise. And that's pretty much it. That's going to cover the uh, cruise portion of this video. Next week, we're going to talk about getting the aircraft in configuration for landing and landing techniques, descent techniques. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Piston Series, where we just get you back up into cruise. And we will catch you again really soon.